bow our heads just a moment for prayer. So happy to be with you tonight. And the first thing we wish to do now is speak to the one that we have come to see, the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we deem this such a great privilege to be in this little church tonight in the service of Thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, our Savior. We thank Thee so much for the grace that He has given to us, shedding forth His blood that we, the unclean, might be cleansed by uh, His great atonement. We pray for the church universal everywhere, for every member, every pastor. We pray especially for this church and its pastor tonight, the little flock that's sojourning here in this part of the city. As members of the body of Christ, we pray that you will bless them, Lord. Bless the deacons, the trustees. And it's such a privilege to come tonight to share the fellowship together, Lord, that we have in this mutual ground through Christ. Now, Lord, we pray that you will save every person here that's not saved tonight. And heal every sick person that's sick. And fill with the Holy Spirit those who are hungering and thirsting for such. Be in the Word tonight, Lord, and wash us by the water of the Word. As we wait farther, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask that. Amen. And be seated. <clears throat> Greetings to Brother Cyril and to the flock of the Lord that's sojourning in this end of the city. So happy to be here tonight to uh, share this time of fellowship with you, my beloved friends. And I see many are standing. We just trust that we won't be very long. A little message from the Lord and mainly a time to get together. And I've suppose I've met Brother before somewhere, and I know I know his face, but the name sounds familiar to me. And um, so we have all one great big army of God's soldiers uh, marching on towards the final victory at the end of the road. And to you Christians who are here journeying, a peace of God be upon you. And i Trust that God will bless this little church and may it grow to a mammoth great church here. All the members be filled with the Holy Spirit and so uh, obedient to the Spirit that sin cannot even enter the doors without being called out by the Holy Spirit. That's the type of church that we're looking for and striving that we might have. I believe that those things are possible and not, it's probable, too, that if we'll just submit ourselves to God and listen to His Word and believe on Jesus with all of our heart, I believe that there will come a church that where them things will take place. I know it would be the hunger of, of every minister's heart Amen. to come into a church that's just so filled with the presence of God and, and everybody just so in harmony with the Spirit until... There will be no a sin. One member could not commit a sin. Just as soon as they walked in there, they know better than to come in the presence of that church with that sin on their life. The Holy Spirit would call it right out, right now, and say, this is what it is. Now, there's where we should be, friends. That's the type of church. And we're striving for that, brother. We're all striving for that thing. And we're tro- hoping and trusting, and my purpose here in Phoenix is uh, to be with the Christian businessman at the convention. They were so nice, the Brother William Shearer, to go around to this fine bunch of brethren, to the different organizations and so forth, and the little uh, churches throughout the country here. And you, brethren, were so nice to bring me in to have this fellowship with you. I'm so happy about it because I really love fellowship with my brethren. I think Jesus said, that's how all men will know that you're my disciples, you know, when, when his love is fellowshipping one with another. We've had three nights now, and last night we were down to Brother Outlaw's church and had a great time there and up at Tempe and then over here to, uh, I'm turned around, I don't know where I'm at, <laughs> over here somewhere back in, in West Phoenix, we was the first night, 
And tomorrow morning, I think, at 10 o'clock is at Brother Fuller's, and tomorrow night is at the Faith Temple on the Indian Road, I believe, or, or Indian School Road or something. Man, I'm all mixed up. <laughs> what is it? McDowell Road. McDowell? McDowell Road, the Faith Tabernacle on McDowell Road. Oh, my. Indian School Road. <laughs> Isn't that something? Mm. Um, is it Calvary? Fellowship Tabernacle. Fella, Fellowship Tabernacle. I'm all mixed up. <laughs> I heard Billy tell me coming out, and I, Fellowship Tabernacle. And, um, but now, you people at your, here at your post of duty is tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. <laughs> Remember that. We're just here visiting. We don't want you to go from one church to another. We'll get to meet one another sometime next week again, you see, and fellowship together. But your post of duty is at your church. I believe every Christian should stand around when he's at that time. So I was talking to a brother here today, Brother um, Sherrod, a precious friend of all of us that we all know, John Sherrod, just a, a prince of a man. And he said, Brother Branham, I often heard you say you was coming to uh, the West someday to live. And I said... Yes, the last tie that bind me to the east is gone. Now my mother. And she went home to be with Jesus a few days ago. And my wife's mother's gone on too. So it is true we're looking for a place to stay. And, uh, and if uh, we would happen to land around Tucson, Phoenix, the Lord leading us this way, I would never want to start a church. No, sir. I would not do that, but I'd, when I, I'm a missionary. And then when I come in, I like to go from church to church with the fellowship like that and have a... I think you got some fine churches here. And we just... Uh, we got plenty of churches. We just need to pack them out and fill them up. That's, all, that's what we need. Yes, we just, uh, just do that because when a person starts a new church, if it's in wherever it is, then see it's bound to pull a little here and there. And that's not the, the thing to do. So if the Lord would lead me, I want the brethren to know that it wouldn't be for a, another church. I just wouldn't do that at all. See, it would just be to come here to fellowship with every one of you, everyone, and um, have a, a great time in the Lord. Now, then don't forget the, um, the businessman, the full gospel businessman. These men are made up of all your churches. And uh, the fellowship begins next Thursday evening, I think. Is that right, Brother Williams? At, um, up at the Ramada uh, on uh, East uh, Van Buren Street. And now there's going to be some great speakers in there that's coming to this meeting. And I um, I'm certainly want to attend it myself to hear those people. Brother Velma Gardner, for one, who is an outstanding speaker. And... Um, Many other other brethren, some of the businessmen that I have never heard yet, they say it's just marvelous speakers. And I'm so glad to hear them, uh, or the opportunity to hear them. So we expect to meet you all up there. And then the Lord willing, I think, um, if it plans out that way, I'm to have the Saturday morning breakfast and uh, speak at the breakfast. And then I believe the following Sunday afternoon uh, at the uh, afternoon meeting. And I hope to meet you there then, all you precious people. Now, I don't want to keep you standing so long because get out early tonight because we ought to get out but 12 or 1 so that you could get back to Sunday school in the morning. We won't do that. We, <laughs> this interpreter here said that towards the people there and I've seen a little smile come across the man's face. <laughs> no, uh, we'll hurry right along. Now, just for a few words, a meditation on the Word. And I am a, kind of a long-winded preacher, I guess. And when I come amongst my Pentecostal brethren years ago, when I was just first come to the Baptist church, I used to think I was a real preacher, you know, packed a Bible under my arm. And one day I come among the Pentecostal people and the Reverend Mr. Darty went out to hear him preach. My, <laughs> mm. he had preached till he lost his breath, buckling his knees and catch his breath. You could hear him about two blocks away, come back up preaching again. So, oh, yeah, right. I, I was careful what I said about then for me. <laughs> I just come along and have to kind of go slow, and I'm a southerner to begin with and slow to start with and always late. And so just bear with me a few minutes and I'll hurry up as quick as I can. But I trust that the Lord will give us a little something here around his word that it'll help us all to get closer to Him. Now, 
over in Malachi, the third chapter, and the first phase of the sixth verse. I want to take a reading. For I am the Lord, I change not. I want to take a little subject, if it be pleasing to the Lord, called the unchangeable God works in an unexpected way. The unchangeable God working in an unexpectable way. Now, we are living in a changing time. Everything is changing. Just everything that you can look at and see with your eyes come out of the earth and it's material and it starts changing. A few days ago when I first come to Phoenix, I, my first visit to Phoenix was 35 years ago this coming September. And I lived out on the desert on 16th and Henshaw and I went down there and they... The house is gone. There's a filling station and a city sits there. And also the road had been changed from Henshaw to, to Buckeye Road. Well, there'd be no way of ever finding it if you just wouldn't happen to ask around. And that's happened in 35 years. Everything is so different. And I remember going out where the big Salt River Valley project is. A young fellow and I on horses chasing some burrows. Now it's a park down there. So Phoenix has grown from mountain to mountain. It's filled over the country. And it's, uh, it's had a quite a change. You'd hardly know your way around. When I got here, I think the population is around thirty-five or 40,000 people. Today it's a half a million. How that this place has changed goes to show it goes right with the times. It changes just as time changes. Phoenix changes, other places change. And then we also know that roads, I noticed that change. The roads you used to come in on, they don't, they're not there no more. They've <coughs> gone some other way. You try to follow the trail you once come in, you get lost. Run out into the desert somewhere. So the roads has changed. The cities changed. And politics has changed. They're constantly changing year after year. Politics uh, uh, change. And nations are changing. The nations, year by year, change. They change their attitude. They change their programs. And I notice the scenes change as the places. They cut out the timber. They pull down the mountain. And they, uh, Down in Florida, they go out... You go down and go along the coast, and first time you go down there, there's not a thing as coastal water. The next time they've done made an island out there somewhere and got a new big homes built on it, making man-made islands, putting a big pump down in the sea and pulling up the water and spraying it up, and then leveling it out with bulldozers and things and planting a city on top of it and some homes, making islands, blasting off the top of the mountains out here, where it looked like. Hardly a rabbit could go, and they got, they got houses up on there. It's worth $100,000. Scenes change. And we notice people change. It's got so that people today are not friendly like they used to be. I don't know whether you notice it out here or not, but we sure notice it back in the south and east. People are changing year by year. They're too much of a hurry. They just got to hurry up and get this done and run down the road 90 miles an hour, bumper to bumper, and stop in a beer joint and drink a couple hours before they go home. It's in a hurry. Where are they going? You notice most of the women today has wash machines and electric ironers and push-button dishwashers and everything like that, and yet they got less time to pray than they ever had. Right. You know, Suzanne Wesley had 17 children. And she, with them 17 children, packing the water from a spring and washing on her hands, and yet she could find two or three hours a day to pray with her children. With 17 little fellows. 
And out of there come a John and a Charles. That's what's the matter today. The reason our schools are letting down. No ministers coming in. Young man interested. We have, won't need some more praying fathers and mothers. That's what we need to make our schools fill up. Young man's heart burning with zeal to take the gospel. Yes. That's what we need. But things are changing. We could go a little farther to people and bring in the church. Church is changing. We find it that our churches are changing. We are really more or less, I'm talking universally now, that we are more seem to be more interested in getting numbers then we are getting people saved. It just looks like that everybody wants to get the biggest number or have the biggest church or the biggest building or make the biggest denomination or, or something instead of thinking of the poor lost soul. That's too bad, but there's too many of us are doing that. I heard the noted evangelist, Brother Billy Graham, when he was at Louisville, Kentucky. I was... Invited with Dr. Mordecai Ham, a personal friend of mine, that Billy was saved under his preaching. And I was invited to sit at the breakfast with him. And Mr. Graham, in his uh, forceful speaking, said, I go into a city and I'll have stay there six weeks. said, I'll have maybe 20,000 people that will make their, their confession and said, I'll get all their tickets and so forth and give them to the ministers. And said, then another year coming back, said, I'll go around where I had 20,000 converts when I was there that year. The next year I can't even find 20. Yep. said, what's the matter? And he, I was different just a little bit, not to be different with that great evangelist, Mr. Graham, certainly not. But the way that he approached it by saying, What's the matter? And he pointed his finger out and said, Too many lazy preachers. He said, Sit around with your feet on the desk of a, a daytime and night and don't take these cards and follow up. He said, When Paul was here, he went into a city and had one convert. And come back the next year, he had 30 or 40 by that one. He had great, 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 great grandchildren over it, you see. And he said, I have 30,000 and come back, and, or 20,000 and come back and can't find 20. Well, it might have been because of, I'm Pentecostal, and but I wanted to say this so bad that I hardly could hold my peace. But I thought, what lazy preacher put his feet up on the bench when Paul got him saved? See, it was that convert himself that was led deep enough into God till he got a hold. And if a man really gets a hold of God. God gets into the man's heart. Don't worry. Sparks will be flying from every side because he's deep enough in God and his whole life is rooted and grounded in Christ. You see. Therefore, we know that it isn't just lazy preachers. It's because that the, the convert doesn't go deep enough till he loses the sight of the world in the things of the world. If he ever gets close enough to God... He doesn't do that. But we find out that the churches change and the people changes. The roads changes, the scenes changes, the politics changes. But there's one thing that does not change. That's God. Amen. He remains Amen. the same. I am God and I change not. <coughs> no matter how long it is, God has never changed one bit and He cannot change. What a place the reason he cannot change is because God is infinite. And anything that's infinite cannot change. And then let us study this just for a moment before approaching on into the Scriptures. Infinite is infinite. There's, there's no beginning or no end. Right. He is almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipotent, knows all things, all places, all times, all powerful. He's God, and He cannot change. Now, I can make a decision and say it's going to be this way, and I'm finite. I'll have to change because things come up that I, I'll have to say, well, I was wrong. But God can't do that 
Because His one decision is that forever. Amen. He cannot change His decisions. He cannot change it. Therefore, if God's attitude towards one sinner and wanted to repent, Adam and Eve, and God made a way for them to repent, and He forgave that sinner, and the next sinner comes, God's got to do the same thing to that sinner. Or He did wrong when He acted with the first sinner. And if a man was sick, and God healed one man, and then if ever another man comes to God, he's got to do the same thing or he did wrong when he healed the first one right. if he comes on the same ground. What a resting place then for the soul that's seeking refuge. Hallelujah. Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, we wonder how the, the world ever got here. See, the, the Word of God created the world. Amen. Hebrews 11 tells us that the world was made out of things which does not appear. See, God spoke it into existence because He was God. He just said, let there be, and it was so. Therefore, if in the beginning was the Word, and the Word spoken was a creative Word, and every word that's spoken cannot be taken back for a mistake, then in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, which is Christ, and now the Word of God written in the Bible is His Word to us, and every promise has the same power of creation behind it that God's Word did at the beginning if we believe it to be the Word of God. Depends on where the seed falls. If it falls into ground, a, a ground that can create a, a moisture or a nourishment around the promise of God will bring forth every promise the Bible made. It's just as why the right mental attitude towards any divine promise of God will bring it to pass. If you just look at it and take care of the Word just right because the infinite God spoke it. God's Word. Jesus said, Heavens and earth will pass away, but my Word shall never pass away. Oh, how we ought to rest upon that divine promise of the Son of God who said, Both heavens and earth will pass away, but my Word shall never pass away. There is a resting place for the soul. Now, Jesus said in the Word, Jesus said, uh, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. But sometimes when God performs something and does something that we ask for, and yet we don't, it comes in an unexpected way. And sometimes in an unexpected place and at an unexpected time. But God will answer in His own way if you just believe it. You must believe it. Accept it and then don't take it back. Hold on to it. Lay hold of it and say, this is it. God said it. That settles it. If God said so, that's finished. No matter how long, there might not have been one molecule uh, come into existence when He said, let there be for a world. But he, He's eternal. And after a while, they become molecules and atoms and it come up because He said it to be that way. Yes. And here's a promise too that we can think. If He, the one that said that, has brought every word to pass, then He's going to have a church to appear before Him without spot or wrinkle. Yes, amen. And it's going to behoove us, brother, sister, to really be sure that we are right with God. And then because there's going to be a church, 
And we want to be part of that church. No matter what this is here on earth, we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And we can't afford to lose that. Whatever you do, don't forget that. No matter what the neighbor does, what the other fellow does, what your schoolmate does, or what your husband or your wife or anyone else, it's a, a personal affair with you and God. Amen. You must, you just must seek out that salvation. Your father might have been a great man, your mother a great man, but what about you? See, see it's you. You must have it your own self. All right. Now, when Jesus said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, that's just right straight down off of the shoulder. Yes, it is. I will do it. And he was, now, it's on conditions if you'll believe when you ask. Now, in Mark eleven twenty two, we find out that Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, be thou plucked up and cast into the sea and don't doubt but believe that what you have said will come to pass you can have what you've said See? now now the thing you just couldn't get out here and say mountain move down you've got to have a motive and objective to that you see right. and that's you got to find out first if it's the will of God and then your motive and objective to the will of God and then speak to it and stand there. It'll come down. Yeah. Yeah. You see, if you get the conditions right. But you've got to have the conditions right. Now you must remember also that when God answers, sometimes it's in an unexpected way. He's unchangeable, but He does things in unexpected ways. Now let's just call up a, a case or two before we proceed. Let's think of Moses. I like to study Moses. He was such a gallant man. And he gave us the Old Testament through the power of God. And many times the skeptics say, Now, Moses wrote that. And um, uh, how do we know it's right? Well, you can go back and prove that it's right. And if he who could say what has been and or what will be and what was to take place after him and that come to pass, then I believe that that was right also, you see. Amen. It's like a, if we can stand here on uh, in the church and the Holy Spirit can go back down through your life and tell you what was. And you know whether that's truth or not. Well, if you know and know it, that's the truth, then surely you could believe what He tells you will come to pass will be there. Because this bears record for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See? And that's true. And so we see as a witnesses of Hebrews 11 and many places in the Bible that the heroes of faith are those who stayed with God's promise. Yeah. Just stay right there no matter what anyone else said. And God will grant it to you in His own good time. Now, Moses went down into Egypt, or was in Egypt rather. He was born down there. Proper child, his parents see he was. Seen that he was. And they wasn't afraid of the king's commandment. And then when Moses taught by his mother, what a good teacher. Uh, his own mother. And could tell him them stories. Moses, you are my son. But you were born for a purpose. And God will use you someday to deliver Israel. And after the death of... of uh, his precious mother, then I suppose Moses become a great ruler, or next to Pharaoh there was heir to the throne. Then one day he felt for his brethren, and a feeling sometime for something, yet even if we feel we've got to act in God's way to rightly get the job done. Amen. That's right. Certainly. Now I believe that God has mercy upon all the hungry and suffering and and we have all kinds of, of uh, organizations to feed the hungry and things. I believe that's a wonderful thing. But yet the real job is the gospel. Amen. That's the real job is the gospel, taking the gospel. Now, we find out that after he found himself a failure in his own works, because he was a smart man, a military man, and he, was, he had found a failure, then he, he run from the job. 
went out into the wilderness and was out there for 40 years. And he had had a, a, a wife and so forth and his children, or his child rather, Gershom. Now the strange thing is, with a call of God on his life, I'd imagine Moses was never able to get away from that. That's right. Amen. Never able. And there may be people here tonight listening right to us. That down to your life somewhere, you felt there was a call in your life. And you've just never heeded to it. You'll be miserable as long as you live till you heed to that life. And there's no doubt there's people here tonight that's been seeking for the Holy Ghost for years. And you just say, well, I, I don't know. I should receive it. I, well, you'll never, never be satisfied until you do. See? Because you were cut out for that. And now you must make that the first thing in your life, whether you eat again or whether you drink again or whether you sleep again or whatever you do, you must find that. That's right. That must be the first thing. That's it. Just stay right with God's promise. He promised it to you, so you just stay right with it. See? And God will bring it to pass. Now... And he might do it at an unexpected time. He said, well, Brother Branham, I've been working hard today and I'm a little tired and I haven't felt good for three or four days. That might be just the time. Amen. <laughs> you Amen. never know when it's going to happen. Hallelujah. How many times could I stop and for days tell the experienced one to go to the woods to seek the Lord that the, the briars scratch me and the birds annoy me and the mosquitoes bite me? That's just when God's fixing to do something yeah. right then. Just when... Um, just when uh, uh, something seems all unexpected, then God takes place, takes hold. Now, look at Moses. Moses, this great old sheep herder now, he was already 80 years old. He was 40 before he uh, took his stand for God. And then he herded sheep out there, and I guess he was 40 years in the desert, and he's uh, getting to be an old man. Perhaps gray whiskers and long, flowing gray hair. And here he was, not in church. He was under Mount Horeb. And God uh, never come down to a sermon, but in a burning bush. Oh, yeah. See, an unexpected time. An unexpected place. And in an unexpected way. Why, well, he thought God would meet him out there with this stick in his hand or sword or whatever he killed the Egyptian with. But God met him not even in church, under the mountain. Amen. God met him not in the hymns, but in a burning bush. Yes. And not when he was a young man, but when he was an old man. Yes. God called him after he was 80 years old. Think of it. So sometimes we think because we're 35 or 40, whatever you are, you're never too old. Right. you got a soul that's got to live forever. So just remember, it's always that way a God, the unchangeable God, in an unexpected time, an unexpected way, in an unexpected place. Let's take Jacob. Jacob was running. He got caught between two fires. Now he was going home. And Lebanon, his father-in-law, was coming this way after him because his wife had stole their gods. And then he finds out Esau's coming this way after him, his brother, who he had cheated. Now, that was quite an unexpected time for God to visit him. But he was, here come Lebanon this way, and here come Lebanon coming this way, and Esau this way. But Jacob crossed the little brook, and then he got down to business. Yes. And maybe for the first time in his life, he got a hold of something that was real. Amen. And he was able to hold on until the blessing comes. That would be a great lesson for all of us. When you once get a hold of something that's real, hold to it. Amen. Don't turn it loose. Amen. Hallelujah. No matter how many times the sun passes over or... Whatever takes place, how many hungry pains comes, whatever more, hold on to it until you are blessed of it. Until you have the promise of it. Hold on. 
He put his wife and all away from him and separated himself and held on because he was caught between two fires. And God met him in an unexpected way, in an unexpected time, in an unexpected place. That's where God met him. Isaiah, the prophet, a young fellow had leaned upon the good king's arm, and he was a good man, and he had had things easy. But one day the king died, and Isaiah the prophet went down to the altar in the house of God, and while he was praying there, he was caught between his own sins and the vision. And he screamed out, Woe is me! When he seen the angels with wings over their faces, wings over their feet and flying, crying, Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. He cried, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. He was caught in an unexpected time, an unexpected place. He thought, I'll go down and say my prayers and get up and go on because people believe I'm a good preacher or pastor or something. Other, but he was caught there. Not only was he caught in this condition with the vision, but he was caught with unclean lips in the house of the living God. Oh, brother, if that would search out through this city tonight and tomorrow morning of ministers who would stand and tell you that there is no such a thing as divine healing and there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there'd be some more crying out, Woe is me with unclean lips. It is true. Yes, very much so. The Hebrew children. Now, they were caught in quite a predicament too. They were caught in an unexpected place where they met God, for God to come to them in a fiery furnace, unexpected time, an unexpected way. But God is the unchangeable God, unchangeable God, and He does things that way, in an unexpected place, unexpected time, and so forth. Israel asked for a mighty king. They wanted a king to deliver them. That's what they expected God to send to them, was a king to deliver them, a mighty king. That would march like David, the son of David would rise up, come down the quarters of heaven, walk down to the earth, the full angel salute, and... The Father would look out of the heaven and say, I'm sending down to you now the Messiah. And uh, they had it all fixed up that that's the way He was supposed to come. But what did they get? They got a baby instead of a mighty king. A baby born in a, a little stable the side of a hillside. A little cave stable with straw and the manure from the animals. And a, a baby. But it was the answer of their prayer. Amen. He was exactly what they needed. Amen. But they wanted it in their own way. Yes. They wanted it the way they, they thought was best. But God knows how to send it in the way that He knows is best. Amen. Because He's an infinite God. And He knows just how to send it. He knows your needs. He knows how to bring it to you. But the trouble of it is because it don't come the way you think it ought to come, then you're all discouraged and you hand it back to Him. Let's ask Him and believe that He'll send it just the way He wants to send it and accept it upon the basis. Right, that's right, that's right. If you ask Him, don't make Him a liar. He can't lie. He promised, ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. God can't lie. Ask them and it shall be done. Amen. Seek ye shall find, knock it will be open. We yeah. believe that. Certainly we do. They got a manger. So what did they do? Had this little baby in a manger? Is that the mighty king? They refused him. Yes, sir. Why? He didn't come the way they expected him to come. Yeah. Yeah. And friends, you might think that was a horrible thing. It was, but you know we're guilty of the same thing. Yeah. We are guilty of the same thing. We ask God for things and then we walk around and, and if He don't just pour something on us and give us something that uh, we think we ought to have, then we just hand it back. See, don't do that. Ask Him. Stay right with it. Amen. it. Hold on to it if you know it's real. Yes. And what's more real than the Word of God? And the Word of God is made flesh 
and dwelt among us, Christ, and now Christ sent the Holy Spirit, and He is God in spirit. So then hold on to it. Yeah. If the Holy Spirit's here and give us that promise, stay with it. Yeah. What's the matter with us Pentecostal people? Who profess to have the Holy Ghost and afraid to trust God anywhere really. Yeah. What's the matter? We're expecting it in some other way. I think that what we're doing, I'll tell you the truth, I think we're expecting it, God to come in and bloom us out in a great big organization of this type and that type. And when you do, you build complex against the other fella. The thing we ought to do, brother, is forget about that. Your organizations are fine, but what we want is born-again Christians with Amen. salvation in their heart and the power of the Holy Ghost in there to love one another and to stretch out. And I have feelings for one another. Glorious feelings, hopes of feelings, and brotherly affections that binds us together. That's what God wants us to have. He's the infinite God, and He cannot change His words. He cannot change them. Now watch. So they refused Him because He didn't come the way that he ex they expected it to be. And we noticed that He did come in the scriptural form. He come exactly according to the, the scriptural plan, and each one of these did also. At the right place, at the right time, and in the right way. Yeah, God always does it in His way, and it's the right way. Yeah. Now, Moses, why would he doubt? He was called at birth. He was a baby. When God called him, he was born in this world for a purpose. He was born to profit. Oh, it ought to be no hard thing for Moses to think that. Be unexpected because you ought to be expecting God to call him. Jacob, God had just spoke to him and said, Jacob, return home. I'll be with you and multiply you. I will make your seeds like the sands of the sea. Why was he so, uh, so unexpected then for God to uh, come to him at that night when Laban was coming one way and Esau another, yet God promised him. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. There you are, friends. When God makes a promise and the opposition rise, that's only to test whether you've really got the Word or not. Yeah. The man that's got good gold don't mind going to the touching stone. See? That's true. See, it's only a... Peter said, I believe it was, that these trials are come to test us. Try us. See what we'll do with it. Right. When you get the Holy Ghost and, and um, husband's going to run you out of the house or, or mother's going to make you leave home, them things don't give up and go back into the world. That's only a testing time. Yes. Jacob, he ought to know better than that. But he had kind of wasted a lot of his life away and running around and so forth from here to there. And he, I like what he said there, I crossed this Jordan with only a staff. And now I come back in two armies come back so multiplied and they said here's Esau my brother coming this way and my father-in-law's over here after me and that when he got in that kind of a condition but he went to the right place and began to unexpectedly I guess to get the answer but God came down and he had a wrestling match and stayed with God and held on until the blessing got I like Jacob in this way when he actually seen something that was right When he got his hand on something that was true, he held on to it until he got results. Oh, if we would do that. If the church would only do that. If you'd only be convinced that it's right and know it's God's promise and it cannot fail. You just, it cannot fail. Someone talk you out of it say it's uh, for some other generation. It wasn't for us. and That, that isn't Scripture. Jesus said in, in Mark 16, Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. See, Where how for? All the world. Every creature. These signs shall follow in all the world to every creature that believes. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to them it's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. How are you going to do it? The gospel must be preached in all the, all the world, beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24, 49, He said, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you're due with power from on high. Yeah. After the Holy Ghost, Acts 
I want it, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, then you'll be witnesses of me in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, everywhere. The Holy Spirit bearing record with signs and wonders. Amen. How are we going to get away Amen. from it? It's God's promise. Amen. Don't let the devil, he's slick-tongued as he can be, and a very seemingly a scriptural red person. But he twists it to make it say something that it doesn't say. Amen. And yet the Bible said it's so plain that even a fool shouldn't err in the way. Right. Just take a hold of God's promise and hold on to it. Amen. Hold on to that one until you get a hold of another one. When you see this and answer, then get a hold of this one. Yeah. Yeah. Then hold on to that one until you yeah. get another one. Yeah. Then just keep on climbing. Hallelujah. Is that yeah. choir was singing last night down to the other church, the Brother Outlaw's church, saying, uh, first round was regeneration, and then he kept on. Another one got somewhere else, and yeah, after his while, he went past Mars, Jupiter, and hit the Milky White Way, and just kept on going. I, I like that. See, just keep climbing round by round. Take a hold of God's promise. Say, God, you promised to save me. Hold on to it. Stay right there till you're saved. God, you promised to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Stay right there till you fill with the Holy Ghost. If you're sick, say you promised to heal me. I'm staying right here till you heal me. There you are. That's the way to do it. Stay with it. God is infinite. He's unchangeable. He cannot change. And He does it in unexpected ways. But hold on until the time. Don't tell God what you, how you want Him to do it. He'll do it the way He wants to do it. See? Don't tell Him how to do it. Now watch. Now we find out that Isaiah was born a prophet. Now, he was in the line of duty when he was down there at the altar. It was no strange thing for a prophet to see a vision. So he ought to remember it. He was right in the line of duty, so he wasn't out of the Scripture. He was right in the Scripture. God said, If there be one among you spiritual a prophet, I, the Lord God, will make myself known unto him. What this prophet says comes to pass, and hear him if it don't. Refuse him. So see, Jacob is in the line of the Scripture. Moses in the line of the Scripture. And um, Elijah. Let's take Elijah here. I'd like to say to him. Now, he got out there in the wilderness and got moody, and God sent him fed him with an angel and put him in the wilderness and he wandered for 40 days and nights. And the first thing you know, what happened? He come up back in the cave and the prophet back there, he heard the rushing wind, splashing, blowing. He heard the rocks roaring, everything. He thought, well, that's, that's all right. I've been up on Mount Carmel. I know he answers the thunder and the lightning and the rain. I know it. But what got the prophet was that unexpected, still, small voice. Yes, amen. There's where it makes so many of us Pentecostal people jump. Yes. See? We are expecting something, some other way when God brings it in His own way. Yes. See? We think that it, it, uh, we ought to come in the way we expect it, but God sends it in His own way, the way He wants to do it. Do it. Now, Jesus, when they asked for a king, Isaiah 9, 6, He said unto us, A child is born, a son is given... It is, government should be upon his shoulders. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. You'll be called Emmanuel. And why? He come exactly in the line of the Scriptures. Man. Did he? Yeah. Just exactly what the Scriptures said. Moses was lined up, but it didn't come the way he thought it would. He thought, oh, I'll go down and kill that Egyptian. Oh, that'll be it. Then all the children of Israel will say, so and so. He, see, he's our conqueror. But it didn't come that way. But he was still in the line of the Scriptures. Jacob, all the rest of them, was in line of the Scriptures when God worked. And if we get ourselves lined up with the Word of God and hold on to it, what can I, Brother Branham, what can I do to be lined up with the Word of God? Just take it in your heart and believe it. Amen. Every promise is yours. Amen. It's yours. You can have it. It belongs to you. Every promise in the book you sing is mine. Every chapter, every verse. Amen. Of mine. I'm trusting in His love divine for every promise in the book is mine. See? No matter what the promise is, it's yours anyhow because God gave it to you. Whosoever will, let him come and drink from the fountains of water of life freely. It's yours. It belongs to you. Any promise belongs to you. If you have faith to appropriate it. And it'll do it if you'll just believe it. Now, but when Jesus came, we found out he's born in a manger, so right quick the Jews disagreed. He didn't come the way he thought they thought he was to come, so they just excommunicated him from their fellowship and he was no more in it. But watch what he done. He when he that didn't stop him. When Pentecost is first born, the church is excommunicated Jew. 
That didn't stop the message. That's right. It goes on just the same. Amen. Jesus can't be stopped. Who can stop God? Man. You can't do it. No, you could have more do it. You could have easier stop the sun. But you can't stop God. His program's going to move on. That's right. So uh, it come when the churches back there was praying for a revival. It come in an unexpected way. He got a bunch of some one-eyed colored man over here in California and a, a couple of uh, hobos on the street and things like that and fill them with the Holy Ghost and start a fire that look where it's gone to now. Amen. It's the fastest growing church in the world. Amen. They had more converts last year than all the rest of them put together. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's right. Our Sunday visitor, the Catholic paper, said so. <laughs> they registered a million five hundred thousand. Praise God. What? Glory. God's Word sails on, on, on. Amen. His people will never take down their soldiers. Amen. Because the Word of the living God is burning in their hearts. Amen. That's right. God's sending them things in different places, blessing them, bringing them on. Now let's keep our mind on the Word and on God. And keep moving on. Now don't get it off saying, I'm, we're going to be the biggest group or if we got the best group in the town, the best dressed crowds comes to our place or something like that. If you get that on your mind, you're falling right then. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just remember, wherever the Spirit is, <laughs> there are the living creatures. <laughs> That's right. Stay with the Spirit of God. Whatever you do, stay with that Spirit. Now, Jesus, when He grew up, He proved He was that Messiah they had prayed for. He showed them His sign of Messiah. He proved that He was Messiah by the signs that He did. Look at the woman at the well when He told her her sins, that she had five husbands. Why, she said, Sir, we know when Messiah cometh, He'll tell us all things. But she didn't know who He was. He said, I'm He. Look at Nathaniel when he came back with Philip and he walked up in the presence of Jesus and Jesus Told him who he was. Where he come from. What he been doing. Oh my. It proved. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. My, sure. Because what? He is proven. He was, he was the, they, he was not a, brought in the way that Israel thought he'd be issued in. They thought he'd be a mighty king with a stick in his hand and go out and beat the Romans over the head with it. But that wasn't God's way. That wasn't even the Scripture for him to do it in that coming. The next coming is when he's going to do that. They got the first and second coming mixed up together. Yeah. So he come then, lowly meek, sitting on a mule riding in. And he come out of, um, of the, the smallest city amongst all the, of the big provinces. And all the Scriptures just fulfilled of his coming, the way he'll come. But they failed to see it. See? But he did the Messiah sign. Prove that he was Messiah, and they rejected it because he come in an unexpected way to them. Now, if they had just been willing to accept him upon the basis that God sent him, can we tonight, as Pentecostal people, accept the Holy Ghost upon the basis that God sent it? Can we expect the Holy Spirit to do what God said it would do when he came in? Is that the basis we want to accept it upon? Or do we want to say, Oh, I believe I received the Holy Ghost when I believe. I shook my pastor's hands and I tell you, I, I believe I got the Holy Ghost. That's not what the Bible said. Amen. When He comes, He'll testify of me, Jesus said. See, when He comes. Now, how does He testify uh, of, of God? He testifies it by the life that He lives in you. By their fruits you are known. Amen. You can say, well... Brother Branham, I got the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues. I believe that too. But if that life don't follow that experience, then there was something wrong. See? You got the wrong thing. See? But if you got, if you got the real Holy Spirit and you spoke in tongues, then the life follows it. And then if you claim you've had the Holy Spirit and had the experience, and then your life don't tally up to God's Word, then you've got the wrong spirit. See? Because you can't gather grapes off of a, a thistle. <laughs> you know that. See, and by their fruits, they are known. And Jesus, when He come claiming He was the Messiah, He did the works of the Messiah. Amen. 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 He said, if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe Me. That's right. But if I do the works of my Father, then believe the works. 
What a statement. Same today. As he promised in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The denominations, the great organizations of the world, what do they expect when they see a, a revival and break in the city? What does the denominations expect? A great intellectual speech. He has to come by fine education, swell words, and uh, able with a personality to get cooperation everywhere and, and uh, everything like that in a great big program. What do you do? Get up to the altar a bunch of painted-faced Jezebels that never wash up a bunch of cigarette-smoking guys that claim to be Christians and never straighten their life, still as crooked as a barrel of snakes? And you tell me that that's the Holy Spirit? No, sir! The Holy Spirit is holiness and power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. That is true, my brother. Not no slight, but the... What is it? Get a man up there might stammer a little bit and splutter a little bit in his language and misspell some words or mispronounce them. And then they say, Ah, oh, there ain't nothing to that guy. What about your Dwight Moody? One of the greatest you've had since Charles Finney. <laughs> Trying. What about Moody? He hardly could read his name. Little old shoe cobbler. One day over in his... Preaching to the cockneys over in England, and he tried to read the Bible and he mispronounced it. What you got? Think he called Philistines, Philistines, or something? Some guy word he made it. He tr went back half the verse. He tried it again. He thought he'd have time to try to spell it out. He missed it again. He went back and read the whole thing over and he missed it again. He closed the Bible and he knew that them cockneys were sitting there just. It's got to be intellectual to them. He closed the Bible and said, Lord God, I'll speak with the tongue that you sent me in. <laughs> Brother, he tore that place to pieces. <laughs> the tears rolled down his cheeks. A newspaper come to investigate to see why he's drawing so many people. And the newspaper come and wrote up an article. Said, why would anybody come to see Dwight Moody? He said, the first thing, he's so homely to look at. And said, the next thing says he talks through his nose. He hasn't, got, he hasn't got a good speech. And said his grammar is the poorest he's to nothing. And said he's a horrible to look at. He's fat and round and whiskers all over his face. Oh, they call him everything nearly. His manager come up and said, Mr. Moody, here's what the paper said about you. He read what it was. Mr. Moody said, why would anybody come to see Moody? And Mr. Moody just passed off one side and said, huh, sure not to come to see the Lord. <laughs> that's all. They didn't come to... If you're coming to see Dwight Moody, that's different. He has to be something to look at. Brother, if you're coming for an intellectual speech, that's what you're looking for. That's what you expect. But if you come to see the power and demonstrations of the Holy Ghost, it'll take the power of God out of heaven. Amen. Depends on what you're looking for. What you're expecting. When I come to church, I expect salvation. I expect holy people. I expect a cleaned up bunch from a life of sin. That's what you expect, because that's what God requires. <coughs> but you see how we're letting down the bars? Old Brother Spurgeon, an old Methodist minister friend of mine used to preach on, said we let, or talk, sing about, rather. He said, we let down the bars, we let down the bars, we compromise with sin. We let down the bars, the sheep got out, but how did the goats get in? <laughs> Letting down the bars. <laughs> right. Let out the bar. Stay with the Word. God is the infallible. God the infinite one who cannot change his unchangeable God. The same one that fell on the day of Pentecost and filled all the house with a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire set upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the same God that we look to see. It depends on what you're looking for. The infinite God. I am God and I change not. He doesn't change. He can't change. If that's what He gave those first expectants back there, that's what He gave the second expectants, that's what He gave the third, fourth, and everyone He calls will be the same thing. He said, I am the vine. You're the branches. If a vine puts forth a branch and it brings up grapes, the next vine or the next branch of that vine puts forth a bear grapes. You can't make one bear pumpkins and other watermelons and then grapes. <laughs> you can't do it. See, it shows it's been cast. It's a it's a vine that's been drafted. That's right. There's some vine that's been or some.
branch had been drafted into the vine. I was standing here one time with Brother John Sherrod. He showed me about, oh, about four or five different citron fruits on a, on the, um, a tree. I believe it's pomegranates and, and uh, I know maybe I'm wrong there. It was oranges and lemons and tangerines and tangelos and grapefruits all growing on an orange tree. And I said, but well, Brother John, I want to ask you something. When they come forth now and put forth their bloods again, I said, is it all going to be oranges? He said, no, each one of the branch, each one of the little branches that's cut off and put in this tree, if it's a lemon tree, it'll, if it's a lemon branch, it'll bear lemons. I said, but what if the original tree puts forth another limb and said it bears oranges? That's right. So, brother, we can bounce ourselves in by organization. That's all we got. We bear organizational fruits. We bear organizational evidence. But if you come forth in the vine and it puts you forth a new creature in Christ, you'll bear the life of Christ. So help me, you will. You'll have the same experience they had in the beginning. Amen. I know it's the truth. The denominations look for the intellectuals. The trouble we Pentecostals, we look so much for Russian wind, we miss the still small voice. That's just what it is, see? Yes, sir. It's unexpected sometimes. If it ain't got a still small voice in it, well, uh, has it in there, we don't want to accept it. Sometimes a real good teaching, sometimes they just cut us to pieces, <laughs> kind of ruffle our feathers up a little bit, you know. Sometimes that helps us a little bit. You know that's true. It's the truth. Yes, sir. Something that'll help us. Do us good. Now, Elijah had heard rushing winds, and he knew that was God out there, or something going by. He heard rains, I think. But what alarmed him was when he came in that still, small voice. He had seen him come in the rain. He had seen him come in the fire, even. And he heard the winds, and he heard the rain, and he heard the fire, and seen the fire. And all but he was alarmed when that still, small voice came, so he put a veil over his face and walked out. Oh, brother, that's it. What we ought to do is listen way down deep in our hearts. Amen. That we hear the voice of God, Amen. then walk out on it. Amen. Believe it is true. Yes, sir. Ah, but I wonder today, brother, if we are failing to recognize yet among us the Holy Spirit. I wonder if the people in our attitudes today, if we don't fail to recognize that this is the Holy Spirit. Amen. See? Now, I know to some of you strangers maybe around in the camp tonight, it, some people might live a life that you'd be ashamed to live yourself. That may be true, but my brother and sister, they haven't got what they're talking about. Yeah. That's, right. That's right. That is true. But don't you never judge for that. When I went into India, there was a man who wanted to prove to me he could lay on spikes. One wanted to walk in fire. He wanted to do all these things to show what he could do uh, for a nickel or a dime or a penny, whatever you give him. But listen, he is playing the part of a hypocrite out there. But way back in that interior was some honest person was absolutely doing that thing and they were sacrificing to a god somewhere. But he was playing the part of a hypocrite. We have the same thing. That's exactly right. Some men, women, just are so called, just tries to put on and act like they got the Holy Ghost. And uh, just cause the rest of them goes that way. As I was telling you the other night, when I first got in the pulpit, I, I got up there and I, I watched Dr. Davis the way he preached. And I just got exhorter's license. So I got up there and I thought, say, you know what? I can preach like that too. So I got up there and swung my arms the same way he did and jumped up and down the same way he did. And I was just saying hallelujah and glory to God and hallelujah and glory to God and hallelujah and glory to God. And then first thing you know, when I got down from there, all the old women come around and said, oh, that was wonderful, Billy. But old Dr. Davis sat there and old lawyer you know, looked at me like that. I said, how did you do, Dr. Davis? said, rotten. <laughs> Worst I ever heard. <laughs> oh, my, did he deflate me. So I want you in my study tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. I said, all right, Dr. Davis. I went in and all beat down, you know. He looked at me and said, I guess you feel like you'll never forgive me, Billy. I said, no, I want to know why. He said, when I first started practicing law, he said, I watched a lawyer, and that's no doubt but what you've done, too. Watch me. He said, because I see you tried to go through every action that I went through. He said, but you know what? So the reason I said the rottenness I ever heard he said, because you never brought a bit of the Word of God. You was just crying and snorting and slobbering and carrying on. He said, you never said a thing about the Word. He said, and so he said, I got up there and tried to go through a plea in the divorce case. And I said, this poor little woman, woo-hoo, poor little woman, woo-hoo. Went on like that and said, an old attorney sat across there and looked like that for about a half hour. I got through beating and crying until I was out of voice nearly. So the old attorney said, judge your honor. How much more of this nonsense will your court stand? <laughs> he said, I said, I went to the old attorney, and he told me, he said, you know what? It, you were making a lot of noise and everything. You're, you're oh, that all right. But said, you wasn't bringing any of the law out. It takes the law to defeat the case. 
Brother, that's what I think tonight, too. It's got to be the same thing, brother. No matter how much education, intellectual, and whatever more we got, there's got to be some power in demonstration of the Holy Ghost to prove that it is God. That'll straighten up your life. That'll perform and do the same life that Jesus Christ did. Amen. Promised in the last days that he'd, it'd be light in the evening time. The prophet promised that. We notice the light geographically rises in the east and sets in the west. And the same sun that rises in the east is the same sun that sets in the west. We know that's true. Now, where did civilization start? In the east. That's right. It's travel with the sun. And now it's at the west coast. If it goes any further, it'll come back east again. The east and west has met. Civilization. We want you to notice this just a minute. Now remember, the prophet said, There will be a day that will not be light nor dark, a dismal day. But in the evening time, it shall be light. Amen. Now I notice, it shall be light in the evening time. Now the Son of God shined His righteousness and power upon the eastern people about 1,900 years ago. And there's come a span of time that we've had intellectual teachings, we've had a great time, we've made organizations, we have done great work, which is saying it's just a dismal day. I don't guess you'd get them here in Phoenix, but in the east we get them kind of cloudy, enough light to get around, but the sun isn't shining. Some weren't shining because you, it wouldn't be light if it wasn't shining. But it's not exactly the good sunlight. But then in the evening time, the clouds draw back and the same sun that shined in the east is shining in the west. Then the same Jesus, the same Holy Ghost that fell back on the Eastern people has come down through the day of organization that dropped down here in the last days to shine the light upon the Western horizon. It's the same Jesus, the same thing, the same loving one. He's here tonight in the form of the Holy Spirit. Comes, he's, he's the unchangeable God. He just can't be changed. No, he comes in unexpected ways working wonders, different ways, His wonders to perform. Mysterious ways, rather, His wonders to perform. But remember, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. No one can doubt that. But what He said, As it was in Sodom. Now, in Sodom, that was just before the fire fell and burned up Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we're just before striking that midnight hour for the second coming of Christ and the world to be destroyed by fire. What happened? There was three classes of people in that day. And there's three classes of people today. First, there was the Sodomites, the world. There was Lot and his people, the church, formal, intellectual type. And there was Abraham and his group. Abraham and his group setting up there the elected and called out church. Remember, now, there was three groups, the Sodomites, sinful, wicked, world, like today. There was a church member, lukewarm, cold, Lot, his group. There was Abraham, the called out of it, and was sitting out here in the desert taking the hard things. Right? And the Lord came down in a form of a man, the speaker of these three angels that stood. Now, someone asked me, said, Brother Branham, you don't believe that was God? I said, it was God. Because, now, uh, listen, Abraham called him capital L-O-R-D, and any scholar knows that that's capital L-O-R-D is Elohim, which is God. He said, well, how would he ever... I said, he said, God eaten? I said, Sure. I said, God just reached over and got a handful of uh, cosmolite and whatever more we had to get together and some petroleum and cosmic light and, and some calcium and potash. He said, step in that, Gabriel. <laughs> step in that, Michael. And stepped into it himself. He's God. You fail to see who he is. He's the unchanging God. I'm glad I've got faith in him tonight that someday when my life my body with his 16 elements will be back in the dust of the earth, but he'll say, William Branham and I'll come forth. Amen. He'll Amen. breathe the breath of life into it and say, there you are. He'll bypass the birth of, uh, through my mother and so forth. Like Jesus on his first miracle, he turned water into wine. Eventually it would have been wine, but he bypassed all that procedure and said, 
turn the water to wine. At the resurrection, he'll not say, Mr. and Miss Bram, get married again and bring forth William. He'll speak and I'll come forth. Amen. Amen. That's him. God. Sure he did. Walk down there before Abraham. Now watch what he did now. Remember they was going down. Two of the angels went down and preached in Sodom. Is that right? They had a meeting down there. But what did they... They didn't perform too many uh, miracles. But what did they do? They smote them Sodomites blind. And now we've got them same angels preaching to the church formal today. A Billy Graham and so forth. And what does blind the world is the Word. And preaching the Word is a blind, the unbeliever. But watch this elected, called out church, this angel that spoke there to Abraham. He said, I remember his name had been Abram till just a few days before. And his wife's name had been Sarah, S-A-R-R-A. But he, God had met Abraham in a spirit form and had changed his name from Abram to Abraham. From Sarah to Sarah. And now watch this angel. Dust on his clothes. And he said, Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? I wonder, Abraham must have said, I, my, my leading was right. <laughs> I, I just felt something. That fellow was different. He said, he said, she's in a tent. It's behind you there. How do you know he had a wife? How do you know that his name had been changed? How do you know that she... Uh, uh, these conditions said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. How do you know Abraham was married? Where is thy wife, Sarah? And he said, now watch, ah, that personal pronoun there, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. You see who it was. You see who it was. And he, he said, um, and Sarah in the tent said, how can I? She laughed. In other words, a little sniggering of herself. said, now look, how can I have pleasure again? Abraham was a hundred years old, and the Bible plainly speaks it out there now that they were both well, well old in age. And the way of Sarah had been gone for a long time. Abraham, his body as good as dead, and her womb had been dried up and dead for years. I'm going to visit you according to life, time of life, and you're going to bring this child. I noticed. Before closing. And Sarah laughed said, How... Could that ever be? Me and old as I am have pleasure again in my Lord also. And I notice that's the little L there. Lord Abraham. Him being old also. And the angel said, Why did Sarah laugh? Oh, my. I remember Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. What is it? It's God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling among human flesh in these sanctified vessels that the Son of God's blood cleansed by faith. And God dwelling in these vessels, performing and carrying on the works of Jesus Christ, making Him the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we are baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body, then we become the body of Christ. Then we are resurrected with Him. When He raised up, we raise up also in the resurrection with Him because He is the head and the head and the bodies together. Amen. Then today, Christ is in the church, in you. And His works that He once did, St. John 14, 12, He that believeth on Me, the works that I do, shall He do also. Amen. That's right. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. See there? People don't expect it to be that way. They expect this to be a bunch of uh, literary people who don't even know what they're talking about. They believe it to be some uh, bunch of dummies. Well, we, we might be in the sense that they're talking about. But we accepted the Holy Ghost the way God poured it out and got the same results that they had back there, so it proved that He's the unchangeable God. We get the same results. Amen. My old mother, when she was dying, she said, Billy, you've been, I baptized her many years ago. She said, you've been kind of a spiritual guide to me, Billy. And I said, Mother, you know our people are Catholic. And I said, when I first noted God was, a, God noted all my life from a little boy, but my people never went to church and I went out and talked to the priest and 
He said, this is a church. This is a way. I said, well, the Bible, could I... It said, now you get all confused. See, this is the church. God is in His church. You must believe the church. Well, I went over to the Lutherans and they said, we're the church. We're the body believers. Went over to the Methodists, they said, we're the body believers. And went to the Baptists, they said, no, they're all wrong. We are that. I thought, what is going on here? A church is a body of people. And this one says this way, this one says this way, and this way, and that way, and that way. It, something's got to be wrong. So I said, I went right back to the Bible, Mama, and read just exactly what that first church did. And the way they did it, that's the way I did it too, and got the same results. I said, Praise God. That's good enough for me. As long as I got the same results, I see the same Jesus, I see the same God that worked in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, down the pre nicene Council, He worked in there until the coming of the Roman Catholic Church, that accepted dogmas instead of the Bible, went out through the dark ages and come back through Luther, Wesley, and down here in the Lady of Sin Church age, and it shall be like in the evening time. God will pull out a church that's just standing here. There will be. And seeing the same Holy Ghost by the same promises doing the same works and the same things. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. The unchangeable God Amen. will give you the same Holy Ghost that He gave them there without a change. He'll do the same things that He did when He was sure on earth to any man or woman that will believe it and accept Amen. it if you've got the Holy Ghost, take a hold of it like Jacob did and hold to it Amen. until positive results come. Amen. Amen. Believe it, friends. And at an unexpected time and maybe an unexpected place. But if he'll do it at an unexpected place, how much more should he do it tonight in an expected place where we're expecting to see it happen? Let's bow our heads just a moment. While your heads are bowed, and I trust that your hearts are bowed too. Excuse me for keeping you as long as I have till 9 o'clock. But I'd like to ask you this question. You know, we may never meet again. Daylight may never come in the morning for some of us. And if it would be so that we'd never see another break of day, would we meet again beyond the river? Would there have you the peace and the in your heart and the assurance, a scriptural assurance, as these people I've talked about tonight, that when you met God, you had a scriptural experience. God changed your life completely. And now you are not just the same person, just rebuilt, polished over, but you are a new creature a new creation in Christ. If you're not that way, we have no standing at the altar room, but I'd like to ask your sincerity if you would desire that I'd offer prayer for you here from the pulpit, knowing that someday I'll have to meet you again and meet my words that I've said tonight. Would you, with all with your heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just raise your hand and signify with that, pray for me, brother, and I... I, I want to be that way. God bless you and bless you. Bless you. Young lady, God bless you. Outside, anywhere, put your hands against the windows, wherever it is. God will bless you. Just raise up your hand in deep sincerity and say, God, be merciful to me. I, I have always wanted to be that way, Brother Branham, but somehow or another, I've just never been able to get that. Oh, precious friend, won't you take a hold of something? Believe me as his servant. The Holy Spirit is right. Don't let no one ever talk you away from it. Hold to God's unchanging hand, Christian friend. If you've just joined church, if you've just been baptized in water and haven't yet been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you've never been actually regenerated. Now you say, Brother Branham, I, I spoke with tongues. I, I did this or did that. Now I believe in that too. I told you. But remember, you could dance in the Spirit. You could speak with tongues. I've seen the Hindus do that. I've seen witch doctors speak in tongues and interpret it. And I've heard, I went into a camp one time where there some brothers went in there and seen a table tap out in tongues and a pencil come and write in unknown tongues and them read it all. See, all those things, that's, that could be the devil. But brother, if you do speak with tongues and then you continue to live the life that you once lived, then there's something wrong with your experience. 
If you have got that just the only thing you're la- leaning upon is speaking with tongues, don't you try that. You'll go over the falls and that boat will never stand up to it. But with a, where there is tongues, they shall cease. Where there is prophecies, it shall fail. But when that which is perfect is come, all oh, that love of God so rich and pure, fathomless and strong, then these other gifts will work right in with it. See, that's gifts of the Holy Spirit that's given to you. Speaking in tongues, prophesying, and what more interpretations. That's to edify the church for the edification of the body. But first, receive the Holy Ghost that you see that your life is changed. Now, there's been about eight or ten hands go up since I've been talking. Would there be another before all for prayer? God bless you, lady. Well, God bless you, sister. Would there be someone else? Just put up your hand and say, in deep sincerity, Brother Branham, remember me. God bless you there, brother. Someone else. Just say, pray for me. I can only pray for you, my friend. God bless you, lady. And God bless you there, sister. Now, he sees your hand. Remember, Jesus said, He that heareth my words, believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. We must believe that with all our heart. Just believe it with all that's in you. And God shall take care of the rest. Heavenly Father, we now give this little audience to you. These broke up. Nervous spoken words tonight, Lord. Standing here with a feeling of those people standing there, their limbs aching. God, I claim their soul. The best that I knew how, Lord, to bring the word. My poor, humble way. What little seed was in it, Father? Sow it in the hearts of them people. And I claim their soul. That it shall not be lost. Yes, Lord. But it will appear yonder in that day as a resurrection. Oh, yes, Lord. Grant it, Lord. Thou art God. There's no other God but you. The heathens has images. We have a living God. The only true living God. We can think of you, Father, setting out an eternity millions times brighter than a ten billion suns. Oh, God, shine forth. You who could make the world's put the great solar system in the skies and, and then come down to save a sinner. Interested enough to be here in this little tabernacle tonight with these Christian people. For Jesus, give us the word that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. Now save these people, Father. That's all I know to ask you, and I believe that you'll answer my prayer. Yes, Lord. And I pray that tomorrow they'll be right at the church and ready for baptism, even yet tonight, if they've never been baptized. I pray that you'll fill them with the Holy Ghost. Let them hold on to this real truth of God until death shall set them free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, audience, I want to ask you one question. <clears throat> Solemnly, sacredly, in a few moments, we'll be closing. As I said we may never meet again. I hope we do. But remember, we'll have to give an account for tonight when we come to the judgment. I'll have to give an account for what I've said, for what I do. It all has to be counted up for, to God. And if, if I'm found guilty, you know what happens to me. It, I, I'd rather let me die a sinner, but never let me die a deceiver. <laughs> let me be truthful, honest. Now look. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, and I pray this, now I don't know that He will, because this is just a little audience of people, and there's people standing, and it's time, I'm way over time, it'd be hard to run a prayer line up through here, but I, I'm going to pray for you in the audience. But let, I pray that God will give you something that you can put your hands on like Jacob had. You never had anything. Something you can lay your hands on. Now, to you people out there that's suffering, I spoke to you about an angel that came down, which was God manifested in a human body, which he is manifested in us, if we are believers. And then, when he had his back turned, um, Sarah, he understood what Sarah was saying and doing in the audience. And then one time, make it clearer to you, that he passed through a, a crowd of people, and there was a little woman who probably would be just as disappointed as anyone here. We usually, last night we got in a 
a little stir, and we had uh, so many people be prayed for. Uh, we had the boy to go give out some prayer cards while I was yet preaching. And uh, so sometimes they come back and forth and back and forth, and you all want to go to Sunday school. Someone told me outside, said, let out early because these people's got to drive far and get back to Sunday school. I want to keep that promise. I said, I will. I- I'll do it. See? And I-, I want you to hold. If it's the main thing is get a hold of something that's real. How many believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then, if, if I told you the spirit of John Dillinger had come on me, I'd be a dangerous person to be around. I'd have guns and be an outlaw. If I told you the spirit of, of some great artist was on me, you'd expect me to paint the picture like that artist could. If I told you the spirit of, uh, of uh, a Houdini, the escape artist, you'd expect me to do the things that he did. If I told you the spirit of some great musician was up on me, you'd expect me to touch those keys just in a, a way because his spirit is up on me. See? If I tell you the Spirit of Christ is up on me, then do the works of Christ. Christ said that God was in Him. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. We all know that. that God represented Himself in Christ to reconcile the world to Himself. He was Emmanuel. Jesus said, It's not me that does the works. It's my Father that dwells in me. He does the works. And passing through with that same Spirit in Him, a little woman touched the border of His garment. Now, he didn't feel that physically. You know he never. Certainly not. Because the Palestinian garment, if anybody knows, it had an underneath garment and a big loose garment to hang down like that. So he had never touched it. She had never, he had never feel that in everybody around him. But she touched his garment. By faith, blind Barnabas touched his garment one day at the gate. Because he had never heard that cry. Some of them saying, Hey, you raise the dead. There's a whole graveyard full of them out here. Come do it. And making fun of him and the priest and everything. Come do this and do that. He never said a word. But a blind beggar. Oh, God. And Jesus stopped to bring him here. And that little woman seen she couldn't never get his attention because of rabbis and priests and everybody around him and everybody. And she touched his garment. And Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? And Peter, as much as rebuked him, said, Who touched you? Everybody's touching you. Why say a thing like that? He said, but I perceive that virtue, strength has gone from it. Somebody had a certain touch and he looked over the audience until he found the little woman. And what was her trouble? She had a blood issue. And if she had enough faith to touch God that throwed a reaction upon Jesus. And then if Christ is in us, knowing but the Holy Spirit, won't your same desire touch the same thing? Now, I want to ask you minister something. Does the Bible say that Jesus Christ is a high priest right now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity? Is that right? Right. How many knows that to be the truth? The Bible says that the New Testament. He is right now a high priest that can be touched by what? The feeling of our infirmity. Well, then how would you know you touched him? If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll act the same that he did yesterday. Is that right? Well, now, he has no hands on earth but mine and yours. His voice on earth is ours. Our voice is given to Him. That's why we preach the gospel. We believe it's not us. We're inspired to preach those things, the Holy Spirit speaking through us. See, we don't believe it's we can do that. Certainly not. I know I couldn't. And, and we, we know that. It's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Man, if a man preaches something that's contrary and denies the Word, then how can the Holy Spirit write the Word and turn around and deny it through a man? Amen. Can't do it got to be the Word. It's got to come forth just the way it's written. Just exactly. Now, if he's a high priest, let's hold that one Scripture. Just take that. If he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, then the only way you'd ever know, would he, if he is the same yesterday, day, and forever, he'll act just exactly like he did when that woman touched him. And then, if I be his servant and his Spirit is in me, you can touch his garment wherever you are. It wouldn't, my garment wouldn't make any difference. I'm a man, a sinner, saved by grace. But it's no more than your wife, your husband, or brother, or whoever it might be, your pastor, all of us were the same. But he is the high priest. Amen. I'm not the high priest. He is. You're touching me would do no good, but touching him will. But if I can submit myself to him, I'm just like this, this microphone here. This microphone is a complete mute until something speaks into it. Is that right? right. Well, then, I don't know a one of you out there. And if I would see it over some of it, I do know I wouldn't say nothing. I know 
Brother and Sister Dow sitting right there, and I believe this is a little Greek brother here from Greece that I, uh, I can't think of his name, David. And um, outside of that, I think this is the, these people right here, right? These three or four girls here on this front row, I know them because they're from Georgia and over in Tennessee. They come to my church. Some of them people drive 1,500 miles on Sunday, every Sunday that I preach. Outside of that, I think Sister Evans is sitting right there, and Sister Ungren and then Brother Evans sitting right along there. Now, I'm asking you people, how many in here are sick and knows that I don't know you, know nothing about you? Raise your hand. Have faith. Now, Heavenly Father, you know my heart. And I, I, I don't come to this to make a platform show of you, Lord. You don't have to do this. If you don't want to do it, Father, it's not in your divine will, then just shut it off. We feel that the Holy Spirit's been here and blessed us. But being that I spoke on that subject, I am God and change not. Then when you walk here in a human form on earth, Emmanuel, a little woman touched the garment one day and she was with such a faith that it, he felt it. And your word said, Father, that tonight that Jesus, your son, is our high priest. And he can still be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. There are those in here that are sick. I pray, Father, that you will let them at least one or two or something in here, Lord, that the people might have something to hold on to like Jacob and know that it's the Holy Spirit and never turn it loose until they're blessed. May, if you'll just do that, Lord, every sick person in here will take a hold of that same promise and stay right with it until they are assured in their heart that the blessing of God rests upon them. Now I commit this audience to you, the message and myself, for your works. It's beyond what I can do or anyone else can do from here forth, Lord. It has to be you. So prove yourself present, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the unchangeable God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask this. Amen. I don't feel this spirit. See it like in that way. It's a gift. That don't mean it's any more Holy Spirit than what a little child would have. It's just a gift that goes with the Holy Spirit to make the Word live. Now this, you don't have. To, if He would do it, you don't have to worry. It's, it's a Word made manifest. It's a Word made manifest. Now, I just want each one of you people to think this in your heart. Just, just think this. You don't have to pray it out loud. Just pray it to yourself. Lord, I'm sure that Brother Branham knows nothing about me. He don't know my disease. He don't know nothing about me. And I'm not trying to touch that minister. But he has told us so plainly that you were a high priest, and I've read it. And I, I'm asking you to just let him... Speak to me as Jesus spoke to the woman that, uh, that touched his garment. And just are, if you're not sick, say, Lord Jesus, uh, let, uh, I've always been a little skeptic of this, of anything in the supernatural, but I'd really like to have something I could put my hand on. So let him speak to so and so in here. I'm praying for him or her. Let, it, let him speak like that, I believe. It'll take all away from you. That'll be something that you can put your hands on. Like Jacob and say, this is it. He took a hold of God one time and said, here I am. I can hold it. Would it make you all believe if you would raise up your hands? Say, just, just raise faith in me all around. I can see it down there. God bless you. I don't say that he will. I trust that he will. One time coming down off of a mountain, he said, all things are possible if you can only believe to the epileptic boy's father. If we can just believe, someone who's sick and needy, believe, believe with all your heart. Jeez. If thou canst believe, all things are possible.
Well, you see, you're waiting on Brother Bram. Everyone in here, no doubt, I've been in Phoenix so many times and seen it preaching a message like this, but it's a light. He got a picture of it, and he, most all of you seen the light, have you got it on the pictures and things where it's in Washington, D.C. They got it again here the other day. That bears record of itself is a pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. That pillar of fire was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said, I come from God and I go to God. After his resurrection, he ascended on high. And when he did, he met Paul on the road to Damascus and he was back alight again. Paul could see it. The rest of them couldn't see it. It even made him blind. He was blind. And he said, he seen this light there shining like the sun. He said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. And it's hard for me to kick against the priest. Yes. Now, that same light, the picture of it, if that, is the light, if that is the same pillar of fire, the same Jesus that was on the road to Damascus, Paul, it'll do the same work. Yes. It's got to. Here it is. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, let Satan try to say something. <coughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This little lady sitting here with a blue dress on with sinus trouble praying. You believe with all your heart and it'll leave you. Will you believe it? All right, then you can have it. i never seen the woman, never seen her in my life. Them things are true, aren't they, lady? If they are, raise your hand back for me. You're praying about that. Lord, let him have faith. There's such a nice little lady sitting right back here with a little fur coat or something on. There's that light. Can't you see that hanging right over that woman there? Okay. That woman's in a serious condition. I don't know her. Never seen her in her life. If we're strangers, raise up your hand. But listen, isn't this true? A real strange feeling is around. Real sweet, humble feeling. That's that light I'm looking right at. It. Here, you have tumor. Not only tumor, but tumors are all over you. That's right, isn't it? You believe? God heal you and make you well. Have faith. You believe? Here, a little lady, raise her hand right back here, sitting behind this child in a wheelchair. I don't know that lady. I've never seen her. We're strangers, aren't we, lady? But you're praying for heart trouble. That God will heal you. That's right. Wave your hand like this. Jesus heals you. Go home and be well. You believe with all your heart now? If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Have faith. Don't doubt it. Just believe with all. Here sits a woman right over here, sitting right down a couple of women from Mrs. Sherritt. She's sitting there praying. She's got arthritis. Believe it, lady. You believe it? All right. Receive it. It shall be light in the evening time. The Bible said it would be. The unchangeable God. Tell me who they touched. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I solemnly, with both hands up, I've never seen those people before. Know nothing about them. But He who's present now, you couldn't hide your life if you had to. That's right. He's here. He's Christ. It's real. It's His promise. The same God. Can't you take a hold of it? Grab a hold of it and say, It's mine. Heavenly Father. I bring this audience to you, these sick people. They're indeed. As we quoted last night, there was a little sheep herder one time by the name of David. He was given a charge to take care of his father's sheep. There's many of the shepherds sitting here tonight too, Lord. And he didn't have very much to protect himself and to protect the sheep, but just a slingshot. That was enough. One day a lion came in and got one of his sheep, tuck it out. David knew that the God of heaven was with him. And he grabbed this slingshot and went after the sheep. And he slew the lion, knocked him down with the slingshot, and brought the sheep back alive. Father, sickness, the devil, more than lion has caught many of your sheep. i got a little slingshot here. It's called prayer and faith. 
There's not much to look at up the side of the weapons of medical science, but God, you direct this prayer to that place there. Satan, turn them loose. I'm coming after that sheep. Turn them loose. I'm bringing them back to Father's pasture again tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke every devil of sickness, casting them out of this people. May they go free from this hour on. To the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All who believe your healing, stand up to your feet and say, I now accept my healing. I put my hands on this as Christ and I believe it with all my heart. Your pastor. Hallelujah.